I'm going to start with some preliminary comments about ethics round. So let me share my screen. Let me welcome everyone to this version of Ethics Rounds, October 29, 2021. The CMA code is 15437. So having said that, let me remind everyone that these Ethics Rounds are put on by the Ethical Advisory Committee of the Hospital, University of Maryland. I uh, just wanna remind everyone where we offer a full service consultation service 24 seven. And uh, this shows the many different ways you could contact us. One, you could use my um, uh, cell phone number, which is um, uh, uh, on the slide or place an order in Epic, or you could use Ti Tiger Connect and you could uh, search for UMMC Ethics or my name, Henry Silverman. And this um, uh, presentation is accredited by the University of Maryland of Medicine. And uh, uh, it's designated as um, uh, one AMA category one credit. And you could claim the uh, credit by uh, using the code 15437. And you could register at the um, um, cloud CME. Okay, so uh, learning objectives of these ethics rounds is co upon completion of this activity, participants should be able to discuss ethical dilemmas in clinical practice and use an ethical framework for solving ethical dilemmas. Okay, let me, um, so let me, let me just, uh, Going too fast, yeah. Let me just get, ah, right, I keep on losing my mouse. All right, very good. So our first case is, who can serve as the patient surrogate decision maker? So we have, um, so the patient is a 60 year old African American female with a past history of opioid use disorder who was admitted for altered mental status after a suspected opioid overdose. Patient has a history of lung cancer with brain metastasis um, discovered about two years ago. However, she has not maintained clinic appointments for the last 18 months for her uh, oral chemotherapy. Uh, her hospital course this time has been complicated by severe agitation and hallucinations. And psychiatry has determined that the patient does not have the capacity to leave against medical advice. Uh, the patient has a sister for whom she has been estranged for the last four years, and there is much animosity between them. Uh, in talking to the sister, she expresses much frustration with the patient, saying that she only wants to get high, which has been the case since the age of 16. The sister says the patient has been a drain on the other family members. She would be referred to... Um, Occasionally, the patient would be referred to rehab, and she always end up eloping from that facility. Uh, the sister says if the patient dies, she will not feel any remorse. She is willing, however, to make decisions for the patient. Now, when you go and ask the patient, uh, who do you want to make decisions for yourself in case uh, you're not able to do so for yourself? She says, I don't want anybody making decisions for me. All right. So... Uh, we have a, a patient with some uh, concerns about her capacity to make decisions uh, and a concern among the medical staff is who, who should serve as the patient's surrogate. So let me um, uh, take you to, um, uh, if you go to menti.com and use this code 46932843, you could um, uh, vote. I'm just asking you to vote, not to write anything yet. I just want to warm up the audience. So uh, why don't you go to menti.com and you have three choices. Obtain a court guardian, uh, nominate the sister if she makes decisions that are in the best interest of the patient, or have the patient uh, make the decision that if those uh, decisions advances her welfare. Now, again, psychiatry has has determined her to lack capacity. J 
just uh, in, in leaving AMA. Okay. All right. So we have three for the sisters. Obtained a court guardian. Okay. Very good. Okay. All right. Keep the responses coming. All right. Okay. We, we have a tie now. Who's going to break the tie? I feel like I'm in an auction. Okay. Going once, going twice. Okay. Oh, uh, it's a, I, I feel like it's one of those turtle races to the finish line here. Uh, all right. We got six for the sister. Obviously not a clear majority here, except for the fact that nobody wants the patient to to make decisions that advances, e even if those decisions advances a, a welfare. Okay, I'll give it another 10 seconds. All right, we got 12. Listen, um, this is anonymous voting. So, you know, there's close to 50 people on this call and we only have 12 responses. Come on, it's anonymous. <laughs> Okay, all right, we got one from, <laughs> from that, uh, 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 I was gonna say coercion, but I'm not co coercing you people. Okay, all right, eight, is that it? All right, so, um, a, but, oh, oh two flew in for the patient. Okay, very good, excellent. So uh, I just know you guys have to think more about this case. All right, so we have a majority for the system, um, six, uh, second place is obtained court guardian, and a few people said the, the patient herself. Uh, so where do we, um, let's, um, let's see what we have here. So these are the options that I gave you. Uh, and so um, it's still, uh, at this point in time, it was still un somewhat unresolved as to who could make decisions for the patient, though uh, a lot of people on the medical team was veering towards, towards the sister. So the um, uh, hospital course, patient's delirium continues to resolve and, and she becomes more alert. She says she wants to continue with chemotherapy and would keep her appointment. She wants to live. Um, uh, she is uh, ready for discharge, but it is revealed that she has been evicted from her apartment. And so now we're dealing with what would constitute a safe discharge. Uh, case manager suggests a transfer to assisted living, but who would, who would give consent uh, at, at this point? So should the um, uh, sister provide consent for a transfer to assisted living. So let me, um, let me see if I could, yes, right. Okay, uh, so this is just yes or no. Should the sister provide consent for transfer to assisted living? Oh, okay, not sure. All right, being honest, yes. Uh, okay, so uh, a lot of people uh, saying, uh, the CISA is somewhat consistent with the previous poll um, as, um, uh, as we're voting, uh, people feel free to open up your mic and uh, tell, tell me what you're thinking about. Why, why the sister or uh, why not the sister or what the heck is going on here? Um, anybody willing to, to talk or are you guys still not warmed up. Well, I'll say something. Do, does the patient now have capacity? Has that been established? Being a little better doesn't entail having capacity. Um, well, that's a, that's a good question. It might or might not. And um, essentially that um, should be determined. Now, having said that, the, the concern was that if she, if she refused to go to assisted living. I mean, right now she has no place to go. So do we send her out to the streets? Well, Deshaun, I'll answer that question, okay? Uh, I'll answer the easy questions here. The, the answer is no, because that would not be a safe discharge. Now, if she says no for assisted living, it could very well be that 
uh, psychiatry will come in and say she doesn't have capacity to refuse assisted living because there are no other options out there. So now, uh, giving you some more details, should the sister now provide consent? Um, and again, it's a, it's a close call between the sister and the patient. Uh, uh, again, if the patient refuses assisted living, then where, where are we now? So let's, uh, let's continue. Um, um, so, uh, so the ethical analysis is as, shut, is as such, although the patient has been determined not to have capacity to leave AMA, this determination does not necessarily apply to decision-making capacity regarding a decision of whom to appoint as a surrogate. Uh, so I think, I think that's the uh, first step is to, uh, in, in anticipation that psych may declare her a lacking capacity to refuse assisted living, we, we have to, um, uh, how should I say, uh, clean, clean up some, some loose ends. And so our recommendation was ask the patient who could make decisions for her if and when she is unable to, to do so. Uh, so, uh, well, and, and in terms of follow-up, a uh, patient does agree with assisted living. And when asked about a surrogate decision maker, uh, she says her sister could make decisions for her when she is unable to do so for yourself. So let me, let me hear a few thoughts here about uh, 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 how could we, um, let me see if I have this, no. How could we um, have the, um, uh, I mean, what do you think about the anim animosity between the sister and the patient and having uh, been estranged for four, four years? Uh, this, that makes the sister, a, a, for the lack of a better word, a good surrogate for the patient or should, <laughs> I mean, uh, or should we go to court? Uh, or does, uh, or is it, is it such that, well, there's a lot of family members being estranged from each other. So uh, that, that might be normal for the court. So does, does that bother anyone about uh, the sister says, if she dies, I'm not going to feel bad about that, blah, blah, blah. What code did you use? What's that? Oh, uh, someone's trying to put in the CME code? You may want to mute yourself. Okay. Uh, and, uh, right, someone left a message here about, uh, uh, yeah, not just psychiatry should weigh in. I, I agree, but... Um, uh, but be careful of what you ask for. No. Uh, 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 I, oh, I I we should that. always get psychiatry involved. But, uh, but having said that, it takes two physicians to declare someone to lack capacity. So the attending should always be involved, should always be involved. Um, okay. All right. Well, um, Except for, all right, well, uh, let me share you some of my thoughts is that the, um, I have some reservations about the sister making yeah. decisions. However, having said that, uh, as long as the sister is making decisions that uh, align with the uh, best medical interests of the patient, we would accept that. If if the sister makes a decision that we think is contrary to the patient's best welfare, then, uh, then at that point, we could choose the, the option to go to court. Uh, right, who decides best interest? That's, that's a, a good question. So actually, uh, I don't have it with me, but the Maryland law defines um, all all the different items that one should uh, take into consideration on, on deciding uh, about best 
medical interests. Now, that doesn't answer the question who um, the um, um, uh, on one hand, historically, it's the it's the physician, uh, but it should be a group decision uh, between uh, psychiatry, the medical team, nurses, case social work, um, all, all, you know, get the whole gang together and 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 see if this is a good decision for the patient or not. Okay, all right, very good. Any any final thoughts? Uh, well, what we. Um, uh, yeah, I'll probably actually the MD. Well, maybe. Um, uh, so um, the patient is still in the hospital awaiting for transfer to assisted living once the bed opens up. All right. Uh, I, I really think that um, there's a lot of issues with uh, who could serve as the appropriate surrogate decision maker uh, in addition to all the end of life cases that we have. All right, well, here's- uh, Dr. Silverman? Yes. Can I ask a question? Absolutely. Hi, I'm from Palliative Care, and then uh, thank you so much for this uh, interesting case uh, presentation. And I'm, I'm interested in this, um, you know, her choosing her sister as a surrogate, I'm, I'm a decision maker, um, because, um, so I'm interested in if she has capacity to appoint but then uh, we need to check if she understands what it means. Is that also if she understands, because we are concerned that uh, the sister might not, um, you know, execute her best interest. But based on our conversation with the sister, right? I mean, she said, uh, you know, she's a burden to her family, blah, blah, blah. And that I'm wondering if we are obligated to provide this information to her because we are concerned or we should not tell her that we had this conversation with the sister and that we are concerned that a sister, you know, about the sister's uh, responsibility or the capability um, to act as a, a best interest. Uh, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good point um, about telling the patient uh, what the sister is saying. Um, having said that, I have a feeling that the two sisters know where they stand in relationship to each other. Um, now, I haven't checked that out, but sure. I I would be surprised otherwise. Uh, and so, but that's a that's a good point. Um, now, um, just to follow up, um, several times I get questions from the medical team. You know, the families uh, uh, we. We have a, a patient who's um, uh, with altered mental status and the family members are always coming in, um, lack of a better word, drunk and, and they're combative. And I get asked the question, uh, uh, we feel uncomfortable with the family um, uh, serving as a surrogate for the patient. And my answer is, I could understand why, uh, but as long as the family is making decisions that we think is in, uh, that advances patient welfare, that's fine. Once they cross what we think is uh, a line that should not be crossed, then, then, uh, but, but then we would need to go to court. We, we can't ourselves disqualify a surrogate from decision-making authority. Uh, one, we don't have the legal right to do that. Two, we can't uh, start assessing capacity in individuals who are not our patients. Um, so it gets a little tricky, uh, but again, as long as the uh, decisions advances the patient welfare, then that should be okay. All right, good. So, uh, and uh, let's see the chat. I have something here. Uh, yes, right. Just because they're estranged doesn't mean that um, they're not good proxy decision maker. As as I somewhat alluded to before, I mean that's 
that's part of that's part of being a family, right? At some point, you're estranged. Well, uh, 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 not for all families, but okay. Next case is elder abuse present. So we have uh, this case. Oh, that's the last case, right? So we have uh, this. 70 year old female with lung cancer and psychotic episodes treated with Seroquel. Her daughter uh, calls up the patient's healthcare provider and, and, and tells the healthcare provider that the patient told her that her husband is beating her up and she has to get out of here. Okay. And uh, the daughter uh, has no way of, of confirming. Uh, confirming or denying the report. Uh, she does say that um, she has heard her stepfather, the patient's husband, being verbally abusive in the background doing phone calls. And she knows that the husband is restricting the patient from speaking to the family and neighbors. Um, so um, she, she is not sure of uh, um, uh, what to do in this situation. And that's why she called that the healthcare provider. So um, now the healthcare provider called the patient and her husband immediately took the phone away from her. Um, the husband reports that they are not doing well. According to the husband, the patient ran out of Seroquel three days ago and her behavior became really bad. She's been having more frequent falls, more delusions and possibly also hallucinations. Um, the husband did report that the patient had told her family that he, the husband, was abusing her, but he denies this. He is feeling overwhelmed and sounds very distraught himself. Um, so the, um, the patient um, healthcare provider uh, reports, uh, the healthcare provider called me up and, and and she reports that the husband has been an exceptional care provider. Uh, now, all of this is happening on a Thursday, and the patient has an appointment with the healthcare provider the following Tuesday. The healthcare provider discussed a possible direct admission uh, instead of waiting until Tuesday. Uh, but the husband said his children uh, are coming up this weekend to help, and he would like to. Uh, still waiting until Tuesday to discuss these issues. So uh, what, what should the healthcare provider do now? So why don't you, uh, go to menti.com. Now I want to hear your thoughts. No polling, forget about the polling. Uh, they're never accurate, right? And we, we have to have, uh, polling uh, watchers. Uh, anyway, so what, what are your thoughts? Consult outpatient oncology and social work. Okay, all right. Um, and I guess my question is, uh, where, where and when would the patient be seen? All right, other thoughts? Arrange for a home health safety assessment, okay. The provider should call 211. Uh, help me out here. What's 211? It's, it's what you call if you're a civilian like I am, if you want to arrange a wellness check and it can be directed to possible abuse. The point, oh, okay. Uh, and the point is, I, I don't, you know, I, I would be wary about calling the police, but professionals trained to assess whether someone is being abused seemed to me to be an urgent necessity here. Okay, that's a good point, urgent necessity, right. Yeah, so um, um, what, what, what are the thoughts about the fact that um, the husband is saying, we'll wait until Tuesday. Uh, so since you brought up, uh, Sam, uh, the issue about urgent necessity, so how should um, the healthcare provider uh, address this urgent necessity. Husband says, no, we'll wait until Tuesday. I have my sons coming in, blah, blah, blah. Um, and what, what's the next move here? Uh, and 
the provider could call 211. Thanks for giving me that number, Sam. I, I think I'm going to take advantage of that number since I feel like people are abusing me constantly. Okay. All right. Um, that's that's a, a soft cry for help. All right. Well, uh, but I know you guys don't really care. So what's the point? Okay. Any, any more um, thoughts? Obtain more history from the daughter. Right, it's just believing the patient's claim of the abuse. This could be, okay, right. Delusion from a mental list. Right, so she ran out of Seroquel, right? So that might be going on, um, but I'm trying to, uh, I, I guess, push a thought about, um, is there time, is there time to think, to to uh, assess that issue, someone needs to examine the patient for injuries. Okay, I I agree. What's the next move in this case? Thank you for calling she, University of Maryland Department of Orthopedics. If you have a okay, yes, yeah, so let's get the orthopedics involved here in this case. All right. For, very good. So, uh, should should the provider call adult if if the husband keeps on refusing to bring in the patient? Should the provider call adult protective services? I don't have a poll for this, so uh, that's that's my thought on the table. Um, so, all right, you guys are. Still not in the writing mode. Okay, let's University go University of Maryland Orthopedics is the official medical provider of the University of Maryland Terrapin. Okay, I already said we shouldn't be calling the orthopedics in this case. So who, who the heck? Oh, I see the person. Okay, she's forever muted. Agree with adult protective services. Okay, all right, good. Um, so, I, um, uh, so here are some options. Refill the Seroquel and wait until Tuesday. Uh, report the abuse to adult protective services um, or impress upon the husband of the need to see the patient before the weekend. So um, uh, the ethics intervention was that uh, I, I spoke with the healthcare provider and I said, uh, we really, need to see the patient right away. And uh, I think it just may be a difficult conversation to have with the husband, but you need to tell the husband, listen, um, uh, it's, it's our obligation uh, to protect vulnerable subjects. And it's, it's our obligation to call Adult Protective Services, um, and we really don't want to do that. Um, but uh, but uh, that's why we want to see the patients. So uh, those those are the choices. And um, and and the healthcare provider uh, wrote in her note, uh, ethics suggested that I push harder for a direct admission to the hospital as opposed to calling APS. And, uh, and she sent messages to uh, the psychiatrist in the movement disorder unit to see if we could find a bed before she discussed further with the husband. So, um, so what happened was uh, she spoke to the husband and the, um, they saw the um, uh, patient that Friday, the next day. The husband said, okay. And they made uh, an assessment that it appears that she was having uh, more delusions since she ran out of Seroquel uh, and, uh, and as opposed to actual domestic violence uh, and uh, the delusions, hallucinations of poorly control. Also a visit gives the opportunity to check for any uh, bruises as well. And hospitalization was recommended, uh, but there wasn't a bed. And the husband said, well, let's 
readjust the medicines and see how things go over the weekend and then return uh, Tuesday in three days. And they did some med medication changes. Um, and a uh, patient was seen on Tuesday and she was doing better. And, and so uh, everything went well from, from that on. Uh, so I think, um, all right, any, any final thoughts about that? I think we should, um, uh, yeah, someone I see wrote, I think the provider is obligated to refer, right. I, I agree that, um, uh, and, um, right, someone is writing about, can a prescription be delivered? Um, uh, with the Seroco? Well, the short answer is yes, but I still, I still think we need to rule out immediately uh, uh, domestic violence uh, uh, because um, I think that um, uh, if you uh, uh, wait, uh, even, even if you think it's less likely, uh, over the phone that it might be due to running out of Seroquel. I, I really do think that um, uh, we should um, uh, make the call to APS sooner rather than later. Okay, any final thoughts on this case? Okay, good. Um, all right, so, uh, so I, I'm gonna present the next two cases I'm giving you a little warm up here on involving the moral legitimacy of patients' prior wishes. Now, that may sound a little strange. Well, a patients' prior wi wishes should carry a lot of moral weight. And, and I, I do agree with you. Uh, however, I want to present two situations in which that may or may not be the case. So let's see um, how it goes. All right, so um, let's see. Right, so uh, this is case um, three or four. Uh, is someone still calling orthopedics? Okay, so we have a 59 year old male with a, a history of prolonged hospitalization due to MSSA tricuspid valve infected endocarditis, multiple failed attempts at extubation, and flaccid quadriplegia due to epidural abscess, osteomyelitis, and cord compression. Patient is not a surgical candidate for addressing the epidural abscess, causing cord compression and quadriplegia. Uh, patient is awake and alert on the ventilator, and the ICU team, now the patient has been intubated for several weeks. So uh, on the table is the possibility of a tracheostomy. Patient is awake and alert on the ventilator. When the ICU team talks with the patient about the trach, the patient uh, appears to be adamant about not having a trach. Uh, it is difficult to communicate with him further as he is intubated. So we have that on the table. He's adamant about not having a trach. So uh, there's a family meeting and the surrogate decision maker are uh, his sisters, wife and children are unavailable. Uh, family share that they would like a uh, patient to live and that the patient has expressed to them through their visit that he wants to live. Uh, well, uh, I hear that a lot, and let me just interject uh, a comment. Everybody wants to live, or most people want to live. So uh, that sometimes gets to be a little ambiguous. But anyway, uh, they did express they do not want the patient to suffer. Uh, and they said, regardless of what the patient is saying, the family believes that the patient wants to live on and would would desire a tracheostomy. Uh, the attending is explained that the surgical team would consider placing a tracheostomy. However, he is not a candidate for a PEG tube due to active infection that cannot be cleared. Uh, current treatment 
does not appear to be uh, medically ineffective or medically futile as per Maryland law, uh, but the patient is, is a no code. Um, okay, so what, uh, what should uh, we do now? Should the uh, patient receive a tracheostomy? And uh, why don't you go to uh, menti.com and just tell me your thoughts. Uh, here's the code 46932843. I know you have your cell phones uh, ready. Um, so um, should the patient receive a tracheostomy? I mean, he said, he said no. And he appeared adamant about that. No, he is adamant. Okay. All right. All right. Let me, all right, no, respect the patient's wishes. No, he refused before. Okay. All right, but yes, we cannot confirm his capacity to consent on tray. I'm assuming the patient has been deemed. No, capacity assessment has not been made. Uh, oh, so I have patient are considered to have capacity until they are assessed not to. Uh, possible alternatives to the trach, uh, well, after a few weeks, the conceived wisdom is that you do a trach. Um, uh, no, against this, then no trach, okay. All right, um, well, um, while we're looking at these thoughts, what, what are your thoughts about uh, the possibility that the patient might have capacity on a ventilator while on the ventilator. And two, uh, it might be difficult to assess capacity. You know, uh, assessing capacity involves a conversation with the patient. Um, so, uh, and the family is saying, listen, we know the patient, he wants the trach. What do you do about that? Um, okay, any other? Oh, here's some more. No, no. Okay. Right. Goals of care. Okay, all right. Well, uh, a lot of people are saying no, uh, which, is, which is fine, I guess. Um, I, just wanted to, I just wanted to ask, uh, has the patient been fully appraised of the differences and the costs and benefits associated with these different procedures? That's, that's always the question. Is the patient imagining or thinking that the tracheostomy is going to be, or whatever, is going to be more or less the same? If, if they're making the decision based on they don't think it's going to improve their, their situation, then they haven't been fully appraised of what the procedure is. They're not making a fully informed decision. That's, that's my worry with this case. Um, okay, well, that's uh, certainly a good thought. The, the issue is, does, does the patient know the alternatives? Uh, and more importantly, does the patient really appreciate the situation he's in? Uh, is he saying no because, well, nobody wants a trach. Do you want a trach? No, right? That's, that will be the answer uh, superficially. Um, so how, how do we know that the patient really does appreciate, have the insight about, about a tracheostomy? So that's, that's a, uh, a good point. So follow up, uh, let me check the chat here. Uh, uh, well, uh, I don't think anyone is talking about compassionately extubated. Um, I think it's, um, uh, I, I don't think the situation was such. Uh, though, uh, let me back up a little. Uh, I think that uh, that is a good thought uh, because the patient, uh, uh, let me, right, the patient has uh, 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 endocarditis uh, and epidural abscess. And so, Let's say, so actually, uh, 
uh, people mentioning goals of care. So if the patient said, I've had enough, I can't walk, blah, 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 I don't want a tray, just let me be compassionately extubated. Uh, and so I, I do agree, that's on the table. Um, now, what happens if the family said that? Um, and we don't have, for the lack of a better term, buy-in from the patient. Um, and, and without um, elaborating further, I think the, uh, uh, this is a poor answer, but I'll say it anyway, it depends. Depends on uh, a more investigation about the patient's prior wishes about end of life and, uh, and what reasons are the family giving uh, for compassionate extubation. Like if the family says, listen, he's lived a hard life. He complained about his situation, blah, blah, blah. So again, that needs more investigation, but uh, compassionate extubation is, it should be on the table. So thank you for that thought. Um, okay, so past 24 hours, no acute events overnight, hematochesia from the hemorrhoid, hemodynamics and CPC remain stable in the wheelchair this morning. Uh, IR, interventional radiology, has agreed to insert a peg in next week, okay? And so, uh, and, um, uh, and, and the family consented for a trach and the medical team agreed uh, at uh, interdisciplinary rounds. It was discussed that the patient is, 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 is going for a trach and um, by uh, interventional pulmonology and then a peg by interventional radiology. Uh, mental status continues to wax and wane. Patient needs a pick line for long-term antibiotics for his endocarditis. Patient is transferred to Midtown. And, and uh, I just checked the other day, he's tolerating trait collar trials and now long-term placement is now being considered. Uh, I think for further follow-up on this is that um, uh, the, um, uh, uh, there needs to be a further discussion with the patient. I don't know if that has actually occurred uh, regarding goals of care. So actually, uh, let, me, um, let me check on that. Uh, so here, here's a case in which the patient said adamantly, however you, you appear adamant on the ventilator, uh, that he didn't want the trach. So let's go to the next case. Should the patient's previous uh, express wishes be be followed. So we have uh, this case here, a 70-year-old male with a history of multiple myeloma in remission, status post autologous stem cell transplant uh, a few months ago, who was admitted with labored breathing and is COVID positive. Patient required, uh, is requiring intubation. Now, before intubation, the uh, nurse practitioner had discussed with the patient prior to intubation regarding long-term ventilation. And he stated, I would never want to live on a ventilator like that, never. And the nurse practitioner also asked about a trach. You may think this is a session about tracheostomies, but anyway, uh, never mind about that. A nurse practitioner also asked about a trach and he shook his head and stated, no, never, never. Okay, all right, so, uh, uh, so uh, well, uh, we had a family meeting several weeks later. So uh, this was in the beginning of September, the patient said no, he got intubated, he's been intubated for three weeks, and now we have a family meeting regarding a trach and a peg. The family was in unanimous agreement that they would like to proceed with the trach. And one family member saying he's a fighter. All these patients are fighters. But anyway, he's a fighter and he would not want to give up. And now, interesting, the family said they would rather err on the side of giving him longer life now and dealing with the consequences later if the patient became upset about their decision to put in the trach, okay? 
The attending reviewed with the family that such sediments are completely understandable uh, but, uh, about going for a trike in a peck, but also quality of life needs to be a consideration in these decisions, but currently with regard to a trike and peck, as well as the future uh, 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 regarding, uh, depending on the patient's illness trajectory. The family shared with the medical team that the patient's quality of life prior to the hospital admission was not robust. He was mostly lying down and playing on his iPad. The family was told that the patient's quality of life may be even less in the long term and, and also consider uh, that the family did not want long-term ventilation. Family expressed understanding and are hopeful for the patient to make even small progress towards recovery. So what to do now? Um, should the patient's wishes uh, be followed uh, not to, yeah, should the patient's wishes not to have a trach be followed in this case? So this is just a poll, no, no, th no visible thinking involved. Okay. So, all right, we got four saying yes, follow the patient's wishes. Um, okay. Okay, well, it, it seems. Uh, now, let me, let me ask a, a question, and I was going to say you could do thumbs up, but no one is showing their, their video. Uh, I'm not sure why. Um, uh, so, uh, it, it's... Does the patients, and you could write this in the chat, that's fine. It's a multimedia presentation here. Uh, is the patient's wishes uh, more legitimate or more weightier than, than the previous case? I mean, a lot of people said follow the patient's uh, thoughts, wishes in the previous case as well. Um, uh, but uh, uh, I'm just wondering, are the patient's wishes, in this case, does it have more moral legitimacy? Um, and uh, was an advanced directive ever done? Uh, well, the short answer is, uh, hey, we always have to ask that question, but the short answer is no. Um, and yes, right. Uh, well, if the patient, you ask a good question, if the patient had previously been opposed to a trach when lucid, uh, why would we even offer a trach? Um, well, we have to um, bring that up with the, with the family. Uh, and we can't, we need, well, one, we need consent from the family, but if we want to follow the patient's wishes, uh, then we should not do a trach, but then uh, the next step would be compassionate extubation. But I mean, the family needs to be involved uh, for I think obvious reasons. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, someone is saying, right, about. Um, about a, a time trial to see if he pulls through down the road and for how long, maybe e even while still having the uh, trach tube in. Um, right, yes. Um, the conversation question that I asked, I asked if the conversation with the patient was documented in the medical record. And the answer is yes. And I also asked, was it witnessed? Because according to Maryland state law, um, uh, if you have a conversation with a patient that is witnessed, that, that could also serve as an advanced directive. But the question I like to put on the table is that uh, conversations with the patient uh, uh, surrounding events of intubation, uh, how, how much moral weight should we put on those decisions when, when you're making those decisions in the heat of the moment, if I could, if I could use that phrase. So 
Okay, well, it seems overriding support not to do the trach. Uh, so how do you handle the family? Um, um, what do we do? Um, uh, how do we tell the family? And, and the family is now saying, no, we want a trach in. What's our next move? But I certainly agree. The uh, patient family is making decision based on their personal wishes. Uh, uh, well, the, uh, the family said they were err on the side of putting in the trach and dealing with the patient's consequences later. Um, so what do you do now? Um, well, um, well, what happened? Um, the um, uh, uh, he, he got the trach. They put in the tracheostomy. Uh, a week later, his condition deteriorated. Um, oh, I, I also like to make the case that uh, this patient had, had uh, uh, a lot of strikes against him. Uh, multiple myeloma, COVID, uh, and there I say also he was not vaccinated. So he ha has a lot of stuff going against him, and it seems more likely than not that uh, he was going to require long-term ventilatory support, and he said he didn't want that. Well, patient's condition deteriorated. Uh, they, a medical team with met with the family at the bedside and uh, discussed that he wasn't responding. And uh, the wife and the daughter acknowledged that uh, they had wanted to at least give him a chance of recovery with the trach, but they don't want to see him suffer any longer. And so they made a transition to uh, a, a, palli a palliative approach and they made him DNR, and they were thinking about hospice uh, and they weren't going to escalate any more current treatment. And uh, the patient was not extubated, but the patient did die later that night. So let me, let me ask you a question here. Uh, and so we have two cases here. Uh, um, this last case, um, patient was on high flow nasal cannula, but before intubation, and he said, no, okay? And when push came to shove, the family made a decision. Um, and now in the previous case, the patient was awake and alert, but receiving ventilatory support. And he was adamant he didn't want the trach. He got the trach. Now, last month, I discussed the case, uh, uh, a patient 80 years old, not that that makes any difference, okay? Um, so I'm not even sure why I said that, but she was awake and alert. Uh, well, maybe it does make a difference. Um, and she had open heart surgery. Uh, and a week after that, she told her family, I don't want dialysis anymore. So she had to go on dialysis after the operation. And she said, I don't want dialysis, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, uh, I know I'm going to die without the dialysis, and she had to support of the family. So, uh, what is there some general wisdom we could get from these cases uh, about when to follow patients' wishes uh, in the absence of a, an advanced directive? That, having said that, there's been cases in which we have an advanced directive, and the patient said, "No way." And the family says, no. Uh, and you know what the family says? The family says, well, he has changed his mind since writing out the advanced directive. So what, um, is this something that uh, the family um, has, what do we do? Well, I'm struggling for the words, but, uh, what do we do when we have the patient saying one thing and the family saying no? Um, we, we know he wants to live. And, and that causes a lot of moral distress among the 
uh, healthcare providers because they feel like uh, they they know what the patient wants, express, especially in, in the last case when even before intubation, the nurse practitioner did a good job of uh, getting to know the patient and his wishes. It was a witness conversation that was documented. Uh, uh, at that time, and the family still said no. And so, but any, any final thoughts before we sign off here? Help me out with these cases here. Family is saying, go ahead and do the treatment, even though we have some, some thoughts. Um, do, do we, um, uh, I think, well, let me, it's open mic time, so uh, someone could, have a chance to say their uh, last final thoughts. Okay, have to leave for a call with Dr. Santa. All right, well, that doesn't help us out too much. Um, okay, uh, you have to go with the patient's wishes while continuing to care for the family. Uh, right, well, that's a good point that uh, uh, we, we have to work with the family and getting them to understand uh, that uh, while the, the, um, the weight on patient autonomy, uh, and um, I, I certainly agree. Now, having said all that, I, uh, to give you my personal thoughts, is that I'm somewhat leery of the patient having capacity while on ventilatory support, because uh, just like many people said, does he does that patient really appreciate what's going on, and how much how, how successful could we be with a patient on ventilatory support uh, that they really understand what's going on? Because we don't have the opportunity to ask questions and and get back answers now. In the um, previous case, patient just on a nasal cannula, um, uh, I, I think it's a combination that it appears the patient knew what he was thinking about. Um, I wasn't there, but I'm sure the nurse practitioner did a good job. And, and also, I like to couple that with his medical condition. Um, multiple myeloma, COVID, non-vaccinated, uh, I say non-vaccinated because that uh, may play into the um, prognosis. Um, and the patient's prior quality of life didn't seem to be all that, all, all that well. Um, and, and I think all that in combination with his thought of not wanting to be ventilated long-term and the fact that um, uh, it appears that he will be ventilated long time. Personally, I think more, uh, and, and again, I say this in uh, retrospective, uh, Monday morning quarterback, if I could use that metaphor, that it appears that one, one, one could have um, uh, 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 try, try to see if one uh, turned the family around. I, I don't have any magic tricks. Um, so uh, anyway. Uh, any, if I may, um, one concern yeah. I have about something you said was, you know, the concern about patients making decisions while on ventilation and not understanding or being aware. My, my reaction to something like that, though, is, is twofold. One, I've never been innovated. I've never been on any of these things. I don't know how I would feel about having them having never experienced them. And we do understand, we've, we've seen uh, evidence of the fact that patients, as they deteriorate at times, can and often do become more willing to accept things that they might have not previously. So as they get sicker, they're more willing to say, you know what, I'm okay with this now that I have it. So no, I don't want to live on dialysis, but now having lived with it for a while, I'm okay with this as part of my life now if it keeps me alive and, and so on and so forth. So I, I always get sort of, again, suspect of uh, people making uh, the claim that, well, I would never want to live this way and then being on it and then maintaining that 
uh, demand from before. Yes, we should be aware of their previous wishes, but that may not be the end all be all of the conversation. All right now, I agree with that. Um, uh, there's a phrase, the aspect of the bull changes when once you get into the ring yourself. Uh, <laughs> and, and so um, uh, uh, I agree with that. Um, uh, Patricia just wrote in the chat that they just had um, a patient who was on the vent and was very clear uh, about his or her wishes. And it was difficult for the family, but they worked with the fam um, with the family and convinced convinced them and uh, and finally it was compassionate extubation. So thank you, Patricia, for bringing up that case. And I really think that um, uh, that's uh, we we need to do more of that. Um, and uh, Patricia, may, maybe um, uh, if you could uh, send me some details about that case, I'd like to add it to my growing list of uh, uh, patients' wishes, really. I, uh, so uh, do me that favor, Patricia. Okay, well, great. Uh, thank you very much uh, for sharing your thoughts. Uh, and, um, uh, all I can say is uh, have a happy Halloween, and 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 after that, you know the the uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas, blah blah blah. I'll I'll um, uh, edit this version and send you uh, a recording. So thank you very much for joining once again the Ethics Rounds. Okay, all right, take care. Have a good weekend.